as, thank you for this introduction. And as Mike mentioned, in uh, February this year, Switzerland hosted the Global Ministerial Summit on Patient Safety. 86 ministerial delegations uh, came to Montreux. And uh, I'm happy to share with you the core messages that were presented to the ministers. And I've been invited to also share my thoughts about the way forward. So here you can see the context and atmosphere of the ministerial day. You can see the ministers sitting at the round tables at the front and the patient safety experts sitting at the back with prestigious speakers such as WHO Director General, such as the President of Switzerland, such as the founder of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and uh, the picture of the ministers uh, in Montreux. Day one is a gathering of the experts with 15 panels identifying, collecting, debating the proposed messages for the ministers. And at the end of day one, two of us managed the prioritization process. And we delivered these messages to the ministers on the beginning of day two. So I would like to review with you these core messages that were presented to the ministers. The first one is that an enormous burden of harm remains linked to unsafe care, despite efforts in several domains. According to WHO, one in 10 patients gets harmed receiving care. 15% of hospital expenditure is a result of adverse events, and one in, one in 20 patients suffers avoidable medical ha medication harm. So patient safety is a global health priority that requires urgent action from countries, from institutions, and from providers. There are many prevention and mitigation solutions, but they are only part partly or unsystematically applied. During COVID-19, pandemic-related safety gaps were added to the existing gaps. For example, inadequate infection prevention measures, misuse of antibiotics, unsafe medication practices, increased pressure injuries, and medical supply issues. There is hope, however, as the global patient safety movement is showing momentum. Patient safety has been recognized by the global health, uh, has been recognized as a global health priority by the World Health Assembly. The Global Patient Safety Action Plan from WHO is the first ever global roadmap for moving towards zero avoidable harm. Does this mean we can rest? Well, certainly not. Science has brought us an expanding body of knowledge and evidence to prevent harm. The trouble is that a lot of it does not reach the patients. Adding to the, harms of pa to the harm of patients, the pandemic led to avoidable direct harm to hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers around the world. We have learned that there is no patient safety without healthcare worker safety. In 2015, we found in a study in the Western Switzerland that hand hygiene compliance was 62%. At the same time, we surveyed the staff who believed that hand hygiene compliance was 87%. Yes, until we measure our compliance to best practice, we tend to overestimate our performance. Research shows that it takes on average 17 years from the scientific discovery that improves safety 
until it is implemented in routine clinical practice. So let's face it. We have a chronic weakness on implementation. Our major weakness is not our lack of knowledge. It is our lack of ability to systematically and reliably implement the knowledge at our disposal. We are very much in need for new knowledge around best practices for the process of implementation. During COVID-19, rapid implementation proved possible in service delivery transformations, vaccines development, and digital literacy, for example. So implementation science is the scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. It takes us through steps to understand, one, who needs to do what differently, two, what factors determine whether they do it or not, three, which strategies are effective to target these factors, and four, how can we measure outcomes? While there are no magic bullets and nothing works well all the time, the key to effective implementation is to support actors to change their behavior. Behavioral science, for example, provides practical means to achieve uh, faster and more effective change. The discussions during the expert day have highlighted the need for healthcare systems to have a clear strategy on building capacity and capability for patient safety improvement and change. Sustaining improvements requires building capacity and capability such as teamwork, human factors training, leadership skills, data literacy, safety culture, monitoring and feedback. Organizations and nations need a capability plan. And by the way, building capacity and capability also applies to governance bodies, to regulators, and to government. COVID-19 emphasized the crucial role of leadership, of including safety and quality in governance bodies, of data availability, and of a culture of data-informed decision-making. The governance of the macro system is important to support patient safety implementation and create a fertile ground. A key role of governance is to set the direction and vision in partnership with stakeholders allowing the work to be led locally. The basis of safety governance must be what is best for the patient whose perspective should be included in the design of governance models. Governance should foster a culture of openness and trust amongst health professionals. Political leadership should keep putting patient safety at the top of its health policy agenda and should ensure implementation of patient safety strategies. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, countries have observed declining levels of trust in government. Misinformation and disinformation have, at times, obstructed the delivery of safe care. The pandemic also exposed long-standing health inequities impacting patient safety. The scope of patient safety governance should include all healthcare sectors and settings, including primary care, mental health, home care, etc. Research and implementation in patient safety strategies have often started at the hospital. Risks are different in primary care, home care, mental health, but risks are there. Research and improvement programs 
are needed in these fields. Nations should assess the state of patient safety in mental health, be it in the community or in health facilities. Patients with mental health conditions have unique vulnerabilities and their safety matters. And let's not forget that in the expression patient safety, there is the word patient. We need to go beyond doing things for the patient and start doing much more with the patient. We need to partner with patients. COVID-19 was a very noisy pandemic. Let's not forget all the silent pandemics that continue to spread every day, such as healthcare-associated infections, antimicrobial resistance, and unsafe patient care. So these are the key messages that were presented to the ministers in Montreux. I've been invited as the last slide to conclude with my thoughts about the way forward. I believe we should widen our definition of harm and include psychological harm, dehumanization, delayed or inadequate diagnosis in the definition of harm. Culture drives behavior. We should make sure that we lead culture change for patient safety. And to do this, we must walk the talk. We should heavily invest in staff safety, staff well-being, and psychological safety. We should take a leap in partnering with patients and carers, not just doing things for the patient, but doing things with patients. We need to develop interprofessional teamwork for patient safety. Compliance approaches are the first step, but resilience approaches are also needed. We have to start managing risks on the patient pathway, not just in a single ward or in a single institution. We need to invest more in building capacity and capability for patient safety, in infrastructure, in nurturing the ground on which patient safety will grow. And finally, we have a responsibility to embed patient safety in the governance process at the country level, at the meso level, and in the microsystem. Thank you.